bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, the divisional playoff, and then there were eight teams remaining. Bet the Board, as always, part of the Wondry Podcast Network. Should be four great football games on the horizon, a lot of blue bloods, and a lot of youth will be on full display this coming weekend. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined, as always, by my steam colleague and co-host, the one, the only, Payne Insider. And Payne, how goes it this fine Thursday, my friend? It goes it. It goes it. Still licking the wounds from Wild Card Weekend. Suboptimal, to say the least. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how the Buffalo Bills have a 17 nothing lead and find a way to go into the half up a mere field goal against a Miami Dolphins team that looked best equipped to operate at the bottom of the Big 12 with the former Kansas State quarterback under center. But alas, that is the world we live in. Uh, interesting, though, when you look at Wild Card Weekend, a rash of scoring for a year that was dominated by unders. You saw all of these offenses on full display. Yeah, I, you know, what we have seen and what we're seeing this weekend is offense wins, even in the down year. I think we've kind of talked about why some of the scoring was down. We touched on it a little bit at the top last week and, you know, the type of coverages defense has been playing, just very much wanting to limit explosiveness. That's been the, the sentiment. And that's been the transition in the league with defenses being built to defend the pass a little bit more than they were, you know, a couple of years back. And that's the reason for that. But in this type of setting, right, playoff setting, we're, we're pushing and these offenses are going to push. And we saw that even last week in the Giants game. I know they didn't end up scoring on the drive, but they were up seven late, backed up in their own end. And Daniel Jones is coming out and shotgun and the Giants are pushing. And this week you have eight teams seven of which are led by offensive minds. And so, you know, that's that's what we're seeing here. I was a little, obviously, disturbed with our result last week, and I know we talked about it in the midst of it, and just at 17 nothing, we weren't even fathoming a loss there. It was exactly how we how we drew it up and planned it out. And, I mean, 17 nothing with about nine minutes to go in the second quarter. You alerted me the, the live first-half line was... <laughs> Buffalo minus 21 and a half and somehow, you know, three scores and 95 seconds for the Dolphins, none of which traveled more than 23 yards was was ultimately our undoing. But again, I mean, as we've talked about it in short sample size for a season, we're we've dealt with a lot of of negative variance. But anytime I can or we can lay seven in the first half of a game and watch Pinnacle close minus 10, minus 13 and with uh, two thirds of that bet down, the live line is you know, three scores instead of seven we laid, we're going to take it. Uh, I would make that bet again a hundred times. Absolutely incredible. The sequence of events it took for all of that to unfold. You mentioned the offensive minds in seven of the eight games. Stop me uh, if I've heard this before on this very podcast from you. If you're looking to hire for any NFL GMs that may be tuning in, you may want to go offense first. You can figure out what to do at the defensive coordinator spot later. And when you look at the way that the lineup sets up for this weekend, I mean, the changing of the guard, a quarterback official, every starting quarterback in the playoff that's left born in the 1990s Dak Prescott is actually the oldest quarterback at 29 <laughs> it's the second time since the 1970 postseason that every division around quarterback is under 30 years old it happened back in 2005 as well and Patrick Mahomes well he's the only one with a little bit of hardware in his resume it's the first time since 2006 there's only one Super Bowl quarterback winner left in the divisional round, which provides the perfect segue into the first game on Saturday, which has the Kansas City Chiefs welcoming in the Jacksonville Jaguars to Arrowhead Stadium. And Kansas City, an eight and a half point favorite, largely across the board, although we are starting to see some money enter the market for the favorite. Total up a touch from where it opened at 52, now out to 53. Andy Reid, obviously his fingerprints and a coaching tree all throughout the AFC as well. And he'll match wits 
with his former offensive coordinator in Doug Peterson. This marks the first playoff meeting between these franchises, and clearly these teams had done battle earlier this year. Again, the Chiefs won 27-17. It was Mahomes, 26-35, 330 yards, four touchdowns, interception. Travis Kelsey went absolutely bonkers, and credit the Chiefs, they were able to cover that number despite losing the turnover battle. Doug Peterson, a level of familiarity, knows what it's going to take going into this particular environment, how much different it is in Kansas City for the playoffs, but this is also a Jags team that hasn't shown an ability to back down. They got themselves in a huge hole against the Chargers, came barnstorming back, and when you look at Doug Peterson, 5-1 and one straight up, 6-0 and oh ATS as a playoff underdog. The straight up stat does come with the caveat that he hasn't been it dog in this particular price range. We know about Andy Reid off a of bye. The ATS number's not quite there. But Payne, hey, we're football junkies around these parts. We know the high regards that you hold Patrick Mahomes in. You more interested to watch Mahomes match up against this Jaguars defense or see what Trevor Lawrence can do coming of age against the Kansas City defense that hasn't really been tested over the last five or six weeks? Well, a little bit of both, but you referenced that number, and I wanted to ask you this because I know we've we've talked about it a little bit, and you know, Chiefs were around eight, eight and a half, and now we're seeing some of the sharper shops out to nine, even nine and a half. I mean, heck, there's a ten out there in the market. At some point, because these are the only advantage teaser legs, Eagles, Chiefs, is there going to be a situation where we're just manually moving these past the six point mark? And I guess. The question we've had is that's probably not happening on a Wednesday morning or a Wednesday afternoon at some of the sharper shops. It does appear like most games, and that's the one kind of overarching theme of this show that we'll have is there are some battles out there going on this week. But it, initially, you know, we were hearing Jaguars decide, but this feels like some some pretty sharp Chiefs money entering the market, and it's not just teaser protection. I'm so curious because obviously offshore shops that offer much better pricing uh, on a lot of the advantage teasers probably see liability yep. ratcheting up faster than what we'll see out here in the desert and throughout the regulated market. So it'll be fascinating to see that dichotomy, how those numbers split out. Uh, and as we trend towards kickoff on Saturday, I mean, I kind of joked with you and some of the respected betters that we all know and, and interact with that Philadelphia to Kansas City going to be the number one advantage teaser out there. So books may be thinking outside the box early to try and limit some of that liability. Uh, it will be fascinating to watch from a numbers perspective. But obviously, you know, when we're talking about these teams on the football field, you mentioned the game earlier this year and Kansas City has gotten better. But this Jacksonville team clearly believing in themselves, knowing that regardless of what deficit they face, they very much think they're in the thick of things. Yeah, I mean, Jacksonville to me is is playing with some house money and We've seen Doug Peterson make these playoff runs as an underdog and use it to his advantage to get that locker room fired up. And I think, you know, we all knew Trevor Lawrence had the arm talent. We've known that since high school. We've seen it in college. The one thing that we questioned during that little lull the Jaguars had where I believe they were four and eight at one stretch, we questioned his maturity. And I can tell you it got back to that organization pretty quickly. And since that time, Trevor Lawrence is, has grown up, and Doug Peterson even said in his presser this week how much Trevor Lawrence has matured in just the last six weeks. And you can kind of see it, right? The body language is different. Last week against the Chargers, he just he never wavered after the slow start. You could see him running off the field. His head was up. He was motivating guys on the sideline. The guys on the sideline showed belief in him, something we didn't see when he was turning the ball over a bunch during that lull. And I'll be honest, like we upgraded the Jaguars after last week. And we were one of the groups that thought Jacksonville was better than just about anybody this season. I mean, we were having them during that even lull as an above average team. I mean, we had them coming into last week, you know, in the top 10. And so this is a very, very talented team. They spent a boatload of money this off season year. Usually year two is when you see the overspend kind of hinder you a little bit. It's not that initial year. But again, I mean, they were minus five in turnovers last week. Typically, you'll lose games on average by nearly 17 points in that situation. They went out and won it. And the turnovers for me were a little fluky, right? I mean, the first interception's a double deflected pass. One of the picks is on fourth and seven. You can't not throw it. You have to throw it, right? It's a turnover either way. One of the throws, Evan Ingram is getting beaten out physical on an in route by a defensive back and Asante Samuels. And I'm, you know, Team Florida State, but the guy's 
5'11", 168 pounds. <laughs> so if you look right at the actual metrics, Trevor Lawrence only had one turnover-worthy pass last week. So his confidence is high just because I think they'll go and look at the film and you're not going to see a guy who threw four interceptions and you're going to have them overcoming that 27-point deficit. Now, you mentioned some of the Chiefs' improvements actually happened on this side of the ball defensively. This has been one of the quieter improvements throughout the back half of the season since week eight. You're looking at defense number eight in EPA per play allowed for the Chiefs. Defense number 12 in schedule adjusted efficiency. And the way that Spags is playing his defense right now is somewhat beneficial in this matchup. The Chiefs are using too high shell at the fourth highest rate in the NFL. Most of any remaining team in the NFL playoffs. And Trevor Lawrence is QB 19 against that too high shell coverage. Against man, second half of the season, Trevor Lawrence is number one among all qualifying quarterbacks against man coverage. So this has to be a too high shell game for the Chiefs defense. The other interesting change from that first matchup, if you're paying close enough attention, is rookie Trent McDuffie. He's moved into the slot the last three games, and they've moved Willie you know, Sneed back outside. And that's where the Chiefs have been most vulnerable through the air is defending those slot receivers. You go back to that first matchup and Christian Kirk went absolutely nuts. So that's a quiet adjustment that the Chiefs have made with McDuffie now in the slot. Hopefully they have a little bit better of a chance defending guys like Christian Kirk in there and he can't just go completely wild. Other key thing to look at here is the Jaguars haven't been the most efficient running team. They're actually, you know, bottom 10 in the NFL. But the one area where they've been really good is Travis Entienne getting outside. He leads the league in rushing yards outside. So the Chiefs have to be able to set the edge. And one specific area, the Jaguars are fourth in rushing efficiency over left tackle. So whether it's Karloftis or Dano or, or Frank Clark or Dunlap lining up at right end, those guys have to be able to set the edge because that's where the Jags are most effective. That's where Travis Entienne likes to bounce all of those runs. The one weakness you've seen of the Jaguars line is up the middle, and that's where Chris Jones is just having like a defensive MVP type season. No Cam Robinson in this matchup this time. Uh, Brandon Scherf dealing with a little bit of a core muscle injury. No one's really talking about that. He's kind of just not playing to his usual rate of performance. And again, that's kind of where Chris Jones is is eating the Jaguars at the center position and quite vulnerable there. So I think there's going to be some some disruption here. I think on the surface, you know, you're looking at a Chiefs defense perceptually that isn't very good, but they're trending well. You move McDuffie back to the slot if he can defend Christian Kirk a little bit better. You get a little bit more pressure on the outside with Cam Robinson not out there this time quietly. Frank Clark is in in playoff mode when he hasn't been on the field. The pressure rate dips, but when he's been on the field in recent times, like Kansas City is just getting some pressure right now. And again, I think Chris Jones does some damage there on the interior where Jacksonville's a little bit weak there. So you know, you mentioned Doug Peterson. He's going to have a great game plan. We saw it. You know, he's probably going to be pretty pretty aggressive. Last uh, go around, you know, he had the onside kick to start the game and then got a little conservative in some situations and short and medium yardage and plus territory against the Chiefs. I don't think that'll happen here. But uh, my suspicion is, and I'll just be candid, right? We've, we've seen over money on this total, Todd. Our model just didn't didn't get us anywhere near this, but I understand the philosophy of like two offensive minds potentially battling back and forth. And I don't know. I fifty three is a, a large number here. Got a high level of familiarity between two coaches who know each other well. You mentioned that onside kick to start the last game. Uh, pretty interesting. They asked the Kansas City Chiefs special teams coordinator said they'd be ready. I'd love it if Jacksonville deferred and still came out with an onside kick to start things. Going, yeah, you think you're ready? <laughs> Go out there and defend it the right way. Uh, obvious. Someone someone asked Doug about that in the presser <laughs> this week. He said, hey, are you going to uh, come out with another onside kick to start the game? And Doug looked at the guy like he had 12. He's like, yeah. Yeah, we're just going to let them know, and we're going to let them know that we're kicking it to the left this time. They they always (laughs) say the best way to hide is right there in plain sight, so what better way than to try and start things that way? Now, obviously, on the other side of the ball, this Jaguars defense needs to get pressure on Mahomes, but they can't do it without blitzing. When you look at Kansas City, the three losses account for three of the four highest pressure rates against Mahomes this year. But the Jaguars have struggled against quick throws all season long, allowed an NFL high 6.8 yards per attempt versus throws in under two and a half seconds. Uh, Apparently, paying everybody that wanted to eulogize the Kansas City Chiefs offense was a bit premature. 
new faces out there still performing at a high level. Maybe not some of that big play potential on the outside with Tyreek Hill, but they're getting creative, getting players involved. And when you get to the playoffs, it's time to engage the force that's known as Travis Kelsey, who has absolutely feasted over the Chiefs' last five playoff games. Where do you think all of the hate stems from? I know the uh, the lady friend and the little brother are unbearable. Is that where it comes from, from last year? Uh, you know what? For Mahomes, I'm not quite sure. I mean, and hey, look, credit Patrick Mahomes, family first, but getting Brittany and Jackson away from the football field has obviously scaled back some of that. There was uh, you know, some interesting dialogue, but I'm not quite sure. I think, honestly, people hate greatness, and Patrick Mahomes right now is on a trajectory to be the best quarterback in the NFL, since he already is, and that's all always going to draw the ire of 31 other fan bases that wish number 15 was playing for them. There was a post and I'm not sure who it was, so I hate to not give credit, but basically I believe it was since 2018 total expected points added all of the quarterbacks. Patrick Mahomes was number 1 with nearly 900 expected points added. Number 2 was Aaron Rodgers. It included the two back-to-back MVP seasons. He was number two at about half the expected points added as Patrick Mahomes. Josh Allen was three. So to your point, like I just, I love seeing good quality quarterback play. I just, you know, it's it's very interesting. It was more of like the, the sentiment potentially around Buffalo and we don't have to get into that, but there's a lot of people like, oh, the, the Chiefs lucked out with this whole situation <laughs> with the game being canceled between the Bills and the Bengals. And I think everyone with, you know, common sense was like, how did that happen? Yeah, the, Chief, um, the Chiefs would be the inverse. If of the that. Chiefs win on Saturday, uh, let's not sugarcoat it. They'll be just fine on the fast track in Atlanta in a neutral setting. So I don't think uh, they're all that concerned about what they can do from an offensive standpoint. Obviously, you'd like to have the Arrowhead faithful behind you, but we can get we can right. get to that next week. Obviously, if the Chiefs are still around, yeah. I, I, you know, when you look at this matchup, I, how does Jacksonville get stops here? Right, like this isn't what the Jaguars' defense is used to seeing. They've played the very easiest schedule of opposing offenses this year, and now you get number one Kansas City. You know, this isn't Zach Wilson and weather on a short week. It's not Davis Mills. It isn't Joshua Dobbs. You look at the good offenses Jacksonville's faced post bye week, and that's me being nice parsing it out that way because it's when Jacksonville's played its best ball win in seven of eight games. Jaguar defense has faced three top 15 offenses, Baltimore, Detroit, and Dallas. They've given 101 points in those three games. You look at the first matchup between these two teams. The Chiefs scored 27 despite not really being pushed, and they lost multiple possessions in that game. You said at the top there were minus three in turnovers. So the Chiefs were supposed to get the ball out of the break. Doug Peterson went with that onside kick. They recovered it. Pacheco fumbled inside the Jaguar 15. The Chiefs fumbled a kickoff that negated another possession. And the Chiefs really didn't have their full complement of weapons that week either. Juju left with a concussion at the seven-minute mark of the second quarter. Jaguars, if you look at the defenses they had to play or the style of defense they had to play against Mahomes and the Chiefs, like they went with a lot of zone and they got annihilated using zone against Mahomes. I'm not sure what the answer is here for Jacksonville. Really, the only way the Jaguars defense can get stops is to what you said at the top is, you know, pressure or if somehow the turnover bug reignites for for Kansas City like we saw last year. Jaguars do have some nice speed rushers and you know, they're going to have to dominate this game, make Mahomes a little bit uncomfortable. I think we've mentioned this a few times over the season where, you know, we don't necessarily love the Chiefs tackles relative to perception. I mean, they're starting to back up right guard at right tackle and Andrew Wiley. Orlando Brown is highly overrated and doesn't handle speed rushers overly well. The Jaguars are third in pressure rate. And, you know, they're getting that pressure using a below average blitz rate. And if you just go back to that first matchup, Mahomes only completed 60% of his passes when the Jags got home with pressure. He averaged 7.2 yards per pass attempt, and he threw his lone interception when he was pressured. When the Jaguars didn't get pressure, I mean, it was it was good night, Irene. I mean, Mahomes averaged over nearly 10.5 yards per pass attempt. Completion percentage was 80%, and all four of Mahomes' touchdown passes came without pressure. The Jags do a pretty good job. I would say actually really good job defending running back passes. So maybe McKinnon doesn't have the success he's had down the stretch being an integral part of the pass game. But Kelsey, to your point at the top again, and and even Juju probably show well here because the Jaguars have been horrific defending the middle of the field. 
bottom five in yards per target, yards per catch, and catch rate. So you would think Juju and Kelsey are going to do pretty well over the middle of the field. Typically, Todd, this is when Andy Reid brings out the the primo part of of the playbook, (laughs) especially with some added time. So always something that you have to factor in a little bit. There is no doubt there will be a wrinkle that we have not seen yet on tape this year. We can only hope that Andy Reid goes back to the carousel play that was negated because of a penalty that we saw week 18 against the Raiders. The other player that I think they can have some fun with, who we've start to see show flashes, and they've talked about expanding his route tree week by week, would be Kadarius Toney. So I'm very curious to see what the usage looks like there. And for Giants fans that will be tuning in early on Saturday wondering, how the hell did we trade this guy and let Andy Reid unlock his potential? Uh, but it should be a fascinating game nonetheless. Obviously, as we sit here in no man's land, you look at the total. No weather or anything else uh, expected there. I'm very curious to see how this game gets bet on game day, and we'll see if we have a move one way or another. Anything else uh, on the early tilt on Saturday before we go from Arrowhead out to lovely Lincoln Financial? I don't, and that's why this game is so interesting, right? Because the, the side is really not moving in unison with the total. Right for this to to go over the number, Jacksonville is going to have to push Kansas City. Jacksonville is going to have to score, and yet the Chiefs are, are rising on the side. So that's a little interesting to me. We've seen this Chiefs team built to play with leads, and no time of the year more apparent than when they get one in the postseason. They can pin their ears back and come after you. So we'll see what kind of adjustments Doug Peterson and the Jags have to make should they find themselves playing from behind for the third straight week. Mention Lincoln Financial Field and the number one seed in the NFC will start their quest for the Lombardi Trophy Saturday evening when they'll welcome in a familiar foe in the New York Giants. Philadelphia, a seven and a half point home favorite total in the game, 48. When you look at the Giants, they've lost nine straight trips to Philadelphia. The last win there came back in 2013. This will be the third time the Eagles and Giants will meet since December 11th. The Giants have played only four different teams over the last seven weeks. So if familiarity breeds contempt, the Giants have plenty of it right now. A pair of top five rushing offense theoretically should be on full display. When we look at the only meeting of note between these teams, the Eagles closed a seven and a half point favorite on the road at the Giants, winning 48 to 22 in that week 14 matchup. The Eagles took advantage of their ground game, had nine drives, six touchdowns, two field goals, one punt, no turnovers. They did that on the strength of 253 yards rushing, the greatest output since 2014. The Eagles, they got after Daniel Jones, sacked him seven times, or Giants quarterbacks, I should say, sacked Daniel Jones four times, Tyrod Taylor three times. But Payne, this is a very different Giants team that we're going to see come Saturday night. Significantly healthier on the defensive side when Leonard Williams, Adoree Jackson, and Xavier McKinney were all DNPs. And when you look at the Giants, this was a franchise that's performed very well on this stage, going 8-1 and straight up as a playoff underdog since 2007. But Eli Manning ain't walking through that door anytime soon. And while the Giants have been great ATS on the road, what are some of the things that they're going to have to do if they're able to continue success and keep this game competitive for four quarters? Yeah, I think we've talked a ton uh, about the Giants and the Eagles this season that loyal listeners won't really find this much of a surprise. But I think, you know, when you look at Kafka, when you look at Dable, this is very much an offensive team now. And I think the game plan is pretty straightforward and simple. And just based on where the Giants are most efficient and where the Eagles defense has its struggles, there's opportunity here unless Jonathan Gannon makes some adjustments. And there's really not a reason to think that Jonathan Gannon does make these adjustments, but he should, right? I mean, this is the third match of the season. He's got multiple weeks to prepare. He hasn't shown a propensity to switch things up, but I think this is a week where you need to be a little bit more adaptable and scheme to your opponent. But for the Giants, it's all about the quick short throws. And that's where the Eagles have been pretty susceptible. We've talked about it a few times. Extremely poor defending short passes. That's been the problem with this scheme in general, right? Like Gannon just believes he can win with his defensive line and he plays coverage so he's not getting beat by the explosive. If you go back, and this is, I I know we talked about it at the time, Jonathan Gannon was being really criticized. It came last year after the Raider game when Derek Carr just you know put on a show throwing nothing but four-yard passes all game. Uh, Derek Carr completed 96% of his passes at 4.3 air yards in that Week 7 matchup, and everyone just wanted to toss Jonathan Gannon to the curb. He's got more talent. They haven't really played great offenses this season, so 
it's been disguised a little bit, but I think the issues are, are still there. And so it's just about the Giants getting the ball out quickly before the Eagles can rally and tackle. You look at these short passes between one and nine yards, the Eagles are well below average in EPA per pass attempt allowed. I know we talk about it all the time. We've kind of clamored for it. We're hoping that coaches use it more, and that's play action. And the Giants use a ton of it because they're very smart. Over Daniel, I believe it's 35% of Daniel Jones' throws are with play action. This isn't the game for that. Throw it out the window. The Eagles are number one defending play action because they play off coverage. They don't bite often, right? It's it's a keep things in front defense. The Eagles, again, just kind of let their front worry about the run. They don't crash their safeties and linebackers. So no play action this game. It's very much about putting things on Daniel Jones' shoulders early, getting it out of his hands quick, diagnosing things fast. And it, it seems like the way he's trending – He's ready for this. You know, since week nine, Daniel Jones is QB eight in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. You look at that same stretch on early downs the first three quarters, Daniel Jones is QB one in that same metric. And if they can be efficient on early downs and you get in third and manageable, that short pass defense for the Eagles becomes even more susceptible on third down. And you look at this little run for Daniel Jones here and how well he's played over that stretch since week nine, and those numbers have been very, very efficient. It's come against the second toughest schedule of defenses. So you're really seeing the the stock arrow on this offense increase. You're starting to see Dayball and Kafka really in their bag, really focused on specific matchups. They're getting good intel. They're executing perfectly. You also want to fire up Daniel Jones' legs this week because Philly stinks defending both scripted and impromptu QB runs. I mean, Daniel Jones doesn't have the the size or the speed or the athleticism as Josh Allen, but you watched last week. There's a lot of similarities to what they did with Daniel Jones compared to what Dayball did in Buffalo with Josh Allen in these high-leverage situations and games. But if the Eagles are smart, they're more aggressive with their coverage, You force a subpar Giants receiver group to win downfield. There's a little bit of a battle here, Todd. I mean, one group went over 46.5 on the bye Monday. We're now out to 48.5. My instinct is the next move is actually going to be downwards. So another game here with a little bit of a battle. Yeah, you mean you talked about Daniel Jones and the improvement we've seen since week nine. He deserves a ton of credit and Brian Dable and Kafka along with it, obviously playing a major role in terms of just protecting the football. I mean, eight turnovers and 17 starts includes the playoffs. 0.43 turnovers per game. It's the fewest in NFL in the NFL among 33 qualified quarterbacks. 11 starts this season with zero turnovers, most in the NFL. And while I don't want Ken Dorsey and Buffalo to catch any strays here, because we'll get to that I game. I was just about to ask you that. <laughs> Josh Allen suddenly <laughs> turning the ball over with reckless abandon. <laughs> Very different than what we're seeing from the Giants. There's one thing removed from that equation, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to try and figure that out. Now, for all the strides the Giants have made offensively, it's still a defense defense that has a lot of questions that need to be answered. I mean, it was a group that was good against the run, or excuse me, good against the pass, relatively speaking, and struggled against the run, but they stepped up last week. They held the Vikings in check, uh, just limiting Dalvin Cook and company to 61 rushing yards. We know that the linebacking core lacks a little speed, and as a result, they struggled with some of the read option component from the Philadelphia Eagles, but Payne, we've buried the lead in the breakdown of this particular game. Jalen Hurts has now has two more weeks to heal from that shoulder injury that looked to really limit his abilities week 18 in a game that the Eagles had to win. How do we go about handicapping the offense for Philadelphia with the expectations that are real in this particular spot? Yeah, I mean, that's where the variance lies within this game, and it's why, you know, you saw early money come in on the Giants, the places that opened eight and a half before it ever really came onto the screen with a true rotation number. There was books that opened this eight and a half, and then it reopened seven, saw some Eagles money at that price. It's kind of toggled back and forth all week there, and I think it's very much reliant on the information you're getting regarding Jalen Hurts' health. I mean, if Jalen Hurts is healthy, Philly is really going to move the ball. But that's that's the question, right? Can Hurts throw downfield as effectively? Can Hurts contribute with his legs in the zone read run scheme? There was no designed runs for Hurts in Week 18. And his comments after that game weren't great. He said he was really hurting. Now, he's had two weeks off. I'm sure Hurts will be 
a willing runner if the play breaks down on a drop back. But if he can't be a contributor in the zone read and he's not willing to take some hits, the Eagles offense just isn't going to be as efficient. And and you go back to that Week 18 matchup. Jalen Hurts registered his lowest air yards per attempt on early down since Week 1. Only 20% of his passes went 10-plus yards. That was the lowest since Week 1 as well. And he only mustered a 38% success rate on dropback. So he wasn't throwing deep, and he wasn't nearly efficient when he was throwing short. So, you know, the Eagles are playing the game where, you know, they didn't list Hurts on the injury report. 100% healthy. Yeah, my ass. To that injury report. So that's really where things get difficult. You would think, right, if he were to be his healthiest, it would be this week compared to maybe next week if they're able to advance. If Hertz is healthy enough to not restrict the offense, they're going to have success, right? They should be able to run the ball. The Giants have just been piss poor defending the run. Even last week against the Vikings, the Giants allowed 2.9 yards per rush before first contact versus that Minnesota offense, which hasn't really shown an ability to run the ball. Their center came back from a back injury. It was a shell of himself. They were down their right tackle. And, you know, just the Giants weren't great uh, winning at the line of scrimmage against the run. You look at the Giants... Overall, since week nine, horrific, dead last, despite playing a horrific schedule of run defenses. You look over that stretch, they've played the likes of Houston, dead last in rush efficiency, Indy, 31st, Washington twice, who's 29th, Minnesota twice, who's 28th. Now you get number one Philadelphia, and that's really been the trouble in some of those first matchups, specifically that week 14 matchup, is there just really wasn't a way to stop the run to the point where Wink was kind of long, loading the box and playing cover one man, and he was getting shredded on the outside to one-on-one balls to, to A.J. Brown. But, you know, you also look at this Giants defense. I know they're getting substantially healthier. They weren't really great last week. I was surprised. I thought we would have saw a little bit better of an uptick last week, especially the way Minnesota's offense had been trending. But you look at the Giants, they've been horrible on early downs defensively dead last in EPA per play on early downs despite playing a below average schedule of offenses which is quite predictive I know the Giants are healthier now than they have been you mentioned you know the three key cogs returning I just I didn't like what I saw I was very disappointed against Minnesota I mean obviously the offensive game plan was elite it was super efficient I just expected a little bit more from the defense if Wink is smart and not stuck in his ways. He's going to use more zone coverage in this matchup. But again, you go back to week 14, Wink used man coverage 45% of the time, a ton of cover one. Hertz just absolutely ate the Giants up. In the second matchup, Giants only played man 18% of the time. They held the Eagles in check with backups and a must win for the Eagles. Now again, Jalen Hurts wasn't 100%, but you're bailing Jalen Hurts out if you play man coverage. So Wink has to be smart here, use more zone. I'm also interested to see wing splits right Giants pressured Cousins on 44% of his dropbacks last week with just a 15% blitz rate but Wink really hasn't been able to get pressure on the Eagles in the first two matchups despite blitzing about 55% of the time combined in the two meetings the offensive line for Philly is just so good that you haven't been able to get home you're almost better just saying hey if we're not going to get pressure sending the house like we'll just deal with what we can organically and we'll just keep more guys in coverage and hope that a guy that you know, might not have as much zip on the ball, has to fit some balls through some tight windows. Um, you know, you look at the Eagles, they are uh, an interesting thing here when you look at splits, right? Like, if we were helping the Eagles this year, you would come out with a game plan where Jalen Hurts is throwing with play action as much as possible. You look at the splits between what the Eagles are offensively, what the Giants are defensively with play action, that's really a way to to attack this defense. The Eagles are bottom 10 offense when throwing without play action. Top five when using play action. The Giants defensively are the third worst defense defending passes when opponents throw with play action. Third best when offenses don't use it. So this has to be a high play action game for for Jalen Hurts if the Eagles are smart. Dallas Goddard, right? Get him in the mix when you are throwing with play action would just be super smart. The Giants are 24th or worse in yards per target and catch rate allowed to the tight end position. But I think we're going to know pretty quickly here, Todd. Like, there is a path for the Giants, right? And it's that Hertz isn't 100% and he's not involved in the zone run scheme. And that is where their advantage is huge on the ground. And But we talk all the time, right? If you have a mobile quarterback and he can't be a factor in the zone run scheme, you can kind of just focus on the running back. And it's just not as efficient. Wink has to play more zone. Wink doesn't need to blitz as much. 
and the Giants win the game of red zone roulette, which we talk about all the time in a one game sample. And that's that's possible because Hertz is right now QB 30 out of 31 in EPA per drop back in the red zone since week 11. And if he doesn't have his legs, you know, again, red zone roulette, you, you hold Philadelphia to some field goals when they actually do have their drives. That's the way the Giants at least stay competitive on this side of the ball. That's the one thing. I mean, you mentioned it. Hertz's legs become such a big factor, especially when it gets to be a condensed area that they're working through. And if that element that we'll see pretty early on in the game is completely removed, it it allows the Giants to do some unique things defensively. One last question I had for you on this game when it comes to health. Lane Johnson obviously missed the last couple games of the season. We know he's a lot of pressure rate and one and a half percent of his pass block snaps this season. Second lowest rate among all tackles this season. He's going to be out there. He's a gamer. So I'm not going to, you know, ignore that fact. But yep. do we think he's at a 50 percent effectiveness or is that something obviously to monitor early on and go, OK, look, he's at 100 percent. The offensive line is going to be fine or Lane Johnson's working with some limitations and you're going to see the Giants have a little bit of an edge. Yeah, he's going to uh, require some surgery in the offseason. So he's not playing at 100%. And saying that, looked very effective yesterday at practice, moving some big dudes around. And I thought the injury designation was was pretty good there yesterday. And again, some of the stuff that I saw video-wise looked pretty good for Lane Johnson. But to your point, he's, he's very impactful. If you look at just the win-loss column when Lane's out there versus when he's not, is is massive and I know some of those numbers incorporate other offensive linemen injured because the Eagles were beaten and battered in that regard and area last year but even like the down-to-down efficiency stuff the points scored per game all increased with Lane Johnson on the field so uh, a, a huge piece good to get him back does look like he's going to be more than functional based upon the the practice stuff that I saw yesterday. Are you hurt or are you injured? Always resonates this time of year. Easy for us to say, working from the confines of our office, not trying to move 300-pound athletic defensive linemen uh, away from the face of the franchise, in this case, Jalen Hurts. You can follow Payne on Twitter, at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You, of course, can follow me there as well. But most importantly, as always, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And from Saturday to Sunday, Payne, and I don't want to say Saturday's games lack a little bit of the star power with the number one seeds against upstart quarterbacks in the form of Daniel Jones and, of course, Trevor Lawrence, who, at least in the case of Lawrence, may be a fixture in the NFL postseason going forward. But clearly, the main course is Sunday in the matinee performance. 3 o'clock Eastern, Orchard Park, New York, the game that we saw earlier this year on Monday Night Football, at least for a few drives before it was shut down. Buffalo, a five and a half point home favorite total on the game, 49. And we've seen movement on both side and total in this contest. You saw some shops open Buffalo as high as a six and a half point favorite. Others open as low as three and a half before the market is settled. With In regards to the total, you saw this number get bet all the way up to 50 and a half, tick down as low as 47 and a half, 48. And we've seen a little bit of movement there. As far as the weather forecast does call for a chance of snow, some wintry conditions, but at least on the surface as we sit here Thursday morning, doesn't look to be anything massive having a negative impact on two high-powered offense. This is the third meeting in playoff history. The Bagels won back in 1981 and 1988, both en route to Super Bowl trips. Both teams enter on win streaks of eight-plus games. The Bengals, winners of nine in a row. The Bills at eight. Seventh playoff matchup in NFL history with both teams entering on a win streak of eight-plus games. Here are the Bills, second-best scoring offense at 28.4 points per game, second-best scoring defense at 17.9 points per game. First team since the 2005 Colts to rank the top two in those. But it's all about star power under center pain and which quarterback you have more confidence in on this stage. But clearly, they can't do it themselves. Josh Allen, we've talked about being a little bit turnover-prone. And for all the accolades that the Bengals have received in recent weeks, it's an offense that's lacked a little bit of punch. I mean, they were outgained on the stat sheet by 130 yards against the Ravens. Didn't eclipse 250 yards in their win against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Such a fascinating matchup in a variety of fronts, knowing the general public sees the Bengals and their tremendous ATS results over the last 25. And you can understand why the early public lean is towards the road underdog. I think the conversation has to start up front, right? I mean, all of the information leads us to believe that both Kappa and Jonan Williams are 
are down for this game. Whether it's Zach Taylor saying these guys are week to week injuries or, you know, the injury doctors or information. It very much sounds like the Bengals offensive line is going to be some combination of, you know, Ted Karras, Cordell Volson, Max Sharping, Jackson Carmen, and Akeem Adenogy. So three starters down, the best three starters along the Bengals O line. You look at some of these guys and how they've performed this season. It's it's Ted Karras who's having his worst season since becoming a full time starter. And so for reference, like here, like replacement level starter is a sixty grade out of a hundred. Karras is playing to a sixty three. Cordell Volson, the rookie fourth rounder, is playing well below replacement level. He's playing to a fifty one. Max Sharping is never graded out above replacement level he's a 47 this season Jackson Carmen year two neither season is graded above replacement level he's a 49 this season and Akeem Adeneja year three never season above replacement level 43 last year much better this year at a 49 so (laughs) you know I don't really know what that's going to look like I think the interesting thing here is like you would immediately see last week against the Ravens, Joe Burrow's release time was was super quick. It was 2.3 seconds, quickest of any wild card quarterback, and about 0.3 seconds quicker than Burrow's season-long average. Now, Burrow does get it out quick anyways, gets rid of it fast. That's exactly what this game's going to be about. And you mentioned some of the weird openers, right? Some places, again, that when it wasn't on the screen due to rotation number opened as high as six and a half, we got down to three and a half, four. And since then we've, we've seen some, some bills money trickle in, but anytime it gets back to like six, we've seen the buy come in on the Bengals. And I think when that happens, there's this understanding that Burroughs quick release time is something that is pretty standard for him and how the Bills are playing defensively right now warrant potentially a little bit of a buy because since these O-line injuries were being overcounted for. That's kind of the general thought process if you're looking at the Bengals. And, you know, had this game been played last week, our numbers would have been Bills minus two and a half on a neutral. And I know a lot of people are thinking like, you know, that, that was what the spread was in Cincinnati. And I think ultimately we've, you know, on game day saw some sharp money there and I know it was very on early on in the game, but we were 10 minutes into that and you know, the Bengals are up seven, three and driving to make it 14, three and the bills in that particular situation were like plus plus one sixty live. And I just, you know, when you look at what Buffalo's defense is right now, Dane Jackson didn't finish the dolphins game with a knee injury. Jordan Poyer is playing through a torn meniscus. Tredavious white is back from his, you know, 12 month ACL injury, but hasn't played like his old self to this point. You know, you look at White, he's produced the lowest coverage grade in his career this season. Hamlin's obviously out. Micah Hyde's still out. Maybe if Buffalo makes the AFC Championship game, Mike is there. I know he's itching to play. There's a chance he's out there for that, but this week he won't be there against Cincy. If you look past the Bills' secondary declining a little bit, since Vaughn Miller went down in Week 12, Buffalo's operating outside the top 10 in schedule-adjusted defensive efficiency. They were fourth the first 12 weeks with Vaughn, and a lot of that has to do with the pressure. You look at, since Vaughn's absence, the Bills' pressure rate numbers are are dwindling, and that's something that's really relevant to this matchup against the Bengals' offensive line with all of those injuries. First 12 weeks, Buffalo was top five in pressure rate while blitzing at a below-league average rate. Since that time, Vaughn Miller went down. Buffalo's blitz rate has increased, and on early downs, Buffalo's pressure rate is above average, so that's decreased. But on the money down, third down, only the Chicago Bears have pressured the quarterback less since week 12 when Von Miller went down than the Buffalo Bills on third down. So effectively what's happening here is Buffalo's pressure rates decreased. Buffalo sends more guys in the blitz so they can actually get home more often. And it's compromised the secondary more than usual. And that's a group that's already dinged up and not playing to previous levels. So since week nine, Buffalo's 22nd in drop back EPA allowed. And so I think there is this idea where Yes, the Bengals' offensive line is a disaster right now. Yes, the offense has been struggling a little bit. Even that Tampa game uh, we've referenced a couple times in Week 15, you see 34 on the scoreboard. It's one of the worst 34 you could ever have, right? It's just even even when they were scoring points due to all the Tampa Bay turnovers, they're still averaging like four yards per play during that stretch in the second half where they're getting all the short fields. 
The second half against New England, when Lael Collins went down, you get blanked. Baltimore, back-to-back weeks, it's not the most overly efficient offensive performance. The first time they played Baltimore in Week 18, you're looking at like 17 play scoring drives that go 60 yards. A lot of it was very much turnover-based. You had the special team score in that game. Last week, again, not the best offensive performance. And then once Baltimore made some adjustments after giving up the quick two scores things were not going overly well and I know Baltimore's defensive front is far superior to this current iteration of Buffalo's so they were able to get some pressure and make Joe Burrow uncomfortable but I think the overarching thought process is Buffalo got their wake-up call last week at three and a half four we're going to lay some some Buffalo because the Bengals offensive line's abysmal and a train wreck and the offense isn't trending overly well but once we get to like six, the number's just so ridiculous. And the thought process is that Joe Burrow gets rid of the ball quickly anyways. He went to the Super Bowl with a makeshift offensive line anyways. And the Bills' defense, the way they're pressuring teams right now, might not get the kind of pressure you would think, especially if Joe Burrow's getting rid of it quickly here. So again, like this is the, the theme of this show, Todd, is there's very much been a battle, both side and total. And to your point, this opened... 50, 50 and a half, got down at Chris as low as 47 and a half. I know a group that made a very sharp bet on the buy using some of their skins went over 47. And then this morning when we were kind of resting at 48, 48.2, a little bit of a wave came into the market and we're back 48 and a half across the board with some 49 out there. And it's just that thought process. Like if Burrow's getting rid of the ball quickly, the pressure won't be as large of a factor and we can't possibly have a Burrow versus Josh Allen total at 47 for 48. It's so wild, too. I mean, when you look at the way those games played out last weekend, Buffalo, to your point, gets the wake-up call against Miami. They win the game 34-31. Don't come anywhere close to covering the closing number in that 13.5-14 range. But you dig into the play-by-play. You look at the overall statistical profile accumulated there, and Buffalo absolutely dominated that football game other than some weirdness, some turnover luck that obviously they bring on themselves. Yet, the Bengals on the other side, people go, oh, it was a pretty impressive performance when you beat the Baltimore Ravens 24-17, when it's a 98-yard scoop and score that completely flipped the script, and the Bengals finished that game minus 130 in yards against the offensive force known as Tyler Huntley under center, who had a lot more success throwing down the field. And the reason I bring that up is because we talk all the time about Lou Anarumo, and obviously everybody has caught on to the adjustments he makes and how good he has been as a defensive coordinator, oftentimes with pieces that aren't elite by any stretch of the imagination. We've seen this Bengals pass rush fall off year over year. The absence of a true number one corner without Shadobi Awuzie. When you look at the Buffalo Bills, there has to be a sick path to success for them being able to attack the Bengals more so than what we saw from just that one drive Monday night a couple weeks ago. To your point, since we've been tracking EPA, that play at the goal line there where Tyler Huntley's extending and he's 0.6 yards away from a touchdown and it ends up getting stripped and returned for a touchdown was the largest singular EPA swing on one play in playoff history. Which, that's how huge that by was. By the way, before, I mean, and that's a lot to unpack there. Can we talk about, you know, the fact that we know that he was 0.6 yards away and that the league has been working with chip technology, yet it's not sophisticated enough for us to identify when the ball crosses the goal line week in, week out, or where the ball should be spotted, that we're still using the chain gang here in 2023? Boy, that's a long discussion, but I've been told there's a couple things. So number one, all of the expedited replays are certainly being enhanced by the chip. The reason they haven't completely relied on the chip is, yes, you can see where the ball is, but there's no detection of where a knee is down. Gotcha. Okay. Right. There, there isn't that conversation between a human's knee going down and where the well, ball let's is. Put it the just ch- shows where the ball is, right? Put a chip in the <laughs> knee pad. Let's go. Come on, next yeah. gen stats yeah. in the that's, NFL. That's, let's that's, go. That's, yeah, that's why it hasn't no, been that fully makes incorporated sense. yet. But yeah, sorry, I didn't want to go away from that. But that's mind-boggling when you talk about the EPA impact and the Bengals more or less getting a de facto free pass because I'm not sure they necessarily marched down the field to tie it up. Although, I mean, we know we saw Joe Burrow operate with ruthless efficiency when he needed to, but a game that was much closer than what the Bengals wanted. But here comes a Bills team that has significantly better playmakers and a guy capable of making those big plays under center. Yeah, the interesting part here, and I mean, you know, this is probably both Bengals and Bills fans will hate me after saying this. Neither the Bills offense 
or the Bengals defense is playing to expectation right now the way they're trending. I mean, both are, are leaking a little oil down the stretch here. The Bengals were the ninth best defense in schedule adjusted efficiency the first nine weeks. Since then, they're just slightly above average. And the Bengals really haven't been tested aside from the one Chiefs game over this like eight game stretch. If we throw out the Bills game that that didn't, you know, finish. It's the Steelers with a rookie QB over that stretch. It's it's the Titans, a, a rusty Deshaun Watson who was horrific after returning from the you know the two year absence, a declining Tampa offense, Mac Jones, and then two games against the Ravens second and third string quarterbacks. That's who the Bengals defense has gone against the back half of the season, and yet we're we're seeing a decline in defensive efficiency. And the Bengals are stepping up in class here against a good Bills offense, right? And and they're doing it with Eli Apple on the outside. He's graded out nine points below replacement level in coverage this season. You have a rookie in Cam Taylor Britt on the other side. He's been replacement level in coverage as well. And, you know, the question is for me, what Josh Allen are we getting? Right? It's very feast or famine, despite him being what seems to be the most beloved human in this league. I mean, just last week, 54% of Josh Allen's pass attempts went 10 plus yards. Everything is like attack, attack, attack with very little precision at times. He doesn't seem to be willing to live to fight another day this season. And you mentioned the Brian Dayball factor. We've seen Brian Dayball coach him up. And you just look, one-fourth of Josh Allen's throws last week against a bottom eight Dolphins pass defense produced negative one EPA or worse. Only Skylar Thompson was worse last week. First nine weeks of the season, Josh Allen was QB3 in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. And you kind of just quickly saw him slide out of the MVP conversation because since then he's QB10. Through 12 weeks, Josh Allen was QB34 out of 38 qualifiers in red zone EPA because he's just a turnover machine. And Allen needs to get back to think, I believe, Right, and it's something we touched on at the top, and everyone called us bumbling idiots during the, the season preview. Buffalo fans came out in full force because I told you Brian Dayball is that dude. Right, it feels like Allen doesn't necessarily have as much confidence in his OC and in the play calls to where he doesn't feel like he needs to overcompensate all the time. You look at red zone throwaways, right? Living to fight another day. The final two seasons with Brian Dayball. Josh Allen's red zone throwaways were 26%, 21%. This year, it's barely 18%. He's forcing way too many balls into areas he shouldn't be. But if Josh Allen's willing to play within the offense, you can absolutely have success moving on the Bengals' defense, especially through the air. The Bengals are probably wise if they play more zone here, but I'm not sure Eli Apple and Cam Taylor Britt are going to be able to hold up on the outside, especially if they're playing man against Diggs. And we know Diggs' target rate increases against man. And you could see some some explosives down the field. All signs are pointing to Buffalo getting their slot receiver Isaiah McKenzie back, who's a full participant participant, blah, and in practice on Wednesday. You finally saw, you know, Mrs. Beasley's cookies getting involved there in the slot, had the nice touchdown, had the nice explosive over the middle. So hopefully Josh Allen's getting some of those underneath weapons back to where he feels comfortable throwing a little bit shorter. That was something we'd seen diminish a little bit since that elbow injury, Todd. And I don't know if we referenced it last week, but you and I have talked about it via text uh, the last couple weeks. When you look at Josh Allen's elbow injury against the Jets from that point forward, he's 24th in completion rate on throws of less than 10 yards. So maybe it's a little bit of elbow, maybe just you know not confidence in the offense, maybe hunting too many big plays, maybe not feeling as comfortable with his slot options. All of those things have really, you know, again, Buffalo's got a very good offense. It's very like feast, but some of the like down to down efficiency stuff isn't quite there that we've seen in previous iterations of Brian Dayball running this offense. But I think, you know, again, the, the, the theme continues, right? It's like early bills money. Anytime we get to six, a little Bengals money comes in totals had some back and forth. And it just feels like every single one of these games is having a battle side in total between respected betters. I would expect uh, that we see a little bit more Josh Allen using his legs this week, carry just four times for 20 yards against the Dolphins. And that's kind of been the trademark for Buffalo. No reason to run him when you're superior, at least in most facets of the game, to your opponent. Uh, but you mentioned it, yeah. I mean, looking at Josh Allen, whether it's the elbow that's impacting the touch or the receivers. Uh, when I watch Buffalo offensively, I was trying to think of the best parallel for it. And I 
almost get the feeling that I'm watching, you know, our Yankee, our Yankees. It's home run or nothing, and it's very tough for them to string together a rally, to put together that long, methodical drive that we've seen on the other side from the Bengals that the Bills want to go out there, and it's going to have that boomer bust that when it's firing on all cylinders looks as good as anybody, but when it doesn't, it can operate in fits and spurts. The one thing that I'm curious about to see this week uh, that we saw a little bit of last week, despite Devin Singletary being out there for a greater snap share than James Cook in the backfield, it was Cook that got more touches. So uh, we've seen Cook's big play potential. I know he was a player that you were very high on coming into this season. Curious to see what that backfield looks like because I think Buffalo's ground game oftentimes gets overlooked, whether you factor in Josh Allen with a tandem of backs. Uh, that can be an element to force Cincinnati to contend with as well. Yeah, I mean, these are the high leverage situations where you see Josh use his legs a little bit more. I was surprised, you know, the Dolphins did some decent things there last week to limit that as much as they could. There were some instances where, you know, we're in a tight game. Josh clammed up a little bit in, in certain spots, right? There were some some punts there that were a little uh, interesting when you thought the Bills were just ready to kind of take back over the lead. I, I sent you that text where... You know, when they went up 27-24, I was like, great, they're going to cover the full game now. That's just kind of how it was. But, you know, they couldn't really separate. You know, once they got that lead, you're like, okay, you know, this is this is going to be pretty good here. And they just they weren't able to to get some separation towards the end of the game that we thought was was ultimately going to happen. But, yeah, you know, Cook is certainly the guy that's that's coming on. He's a little bit burstier. He's certainly a, a larger factor out of the backfield. They just don't do enough stuff, it feels like getting him in the design throw game. It's very much, hey, we're going to dump this off to Cook if option one, two, and three aren't there, whereas we need to start designing some things to get Cook matched up on linebackers and safeties. There hasn't been enough of that, but again, you, you saw last week that touchdown, just the burst he had to the outside that Singletary just doesn't quite have. Yeah, it looks like Cook is shot out of a cannon sometimes where Singletary is a little bit more of a plotter, and it explains the usage over the last couple of years for Devin Singletary getting used primarily between the 20s more so as a legitimate red zone threat, whether it was Zach Moss or some of the other backs that they've plugged in there. But there's no doubt it should be a great game, and I think a lot of the points you highlighted for Buffalo, we know there's been respected money it came in at a shorter price, but to win by margin, you have to go out there, do the little things, and execute because the Bengals aren't going to roll over and play dead. And you look at their success, ATS, over the last 25 games or so, best team in the league despite not covering back-to-back -back weeks, albeit against a familiar foe in the Baltimore Ravens laying north of a touchdown. The final game of the weekend takes us out to the Bay. When you're looking at the San Francisco 49ers welcoming in the Dallas Cowboys, this number is pretty much four painted as we record here on Thursday morning, although I, there are some three and a halfs at some of the sharper offshore shops right now. Total in the game sits at 46. Ninth playoff meeting between these two proud franchises. It's tied for the most frequent matchup in NFL playoff history. The 49ers extended rest. And I know this is a storyline that's been covered. And when you look at that, the Cowboys will travel twice and have the short week to contend with for the game. But it gets even worse for Dallas because it's not just traveling back-to-back -back weeks in the postseason. They played their final two games of the regular season away from home, albeit on a Thursday night against the Tennessee Titans before they followed it up with a trip to D.C. to take on the Commanders. A rematch from last year's playoff, the infamous Dak scramble game. I'm not sure how much we can take away from that 23-17 49ers win where the Niners outrushed the Cowboys 169-77. The Cowboys committed 14 penalties. The Niners lived in the backfield sacking Dak Prescott five times. And, of course, time expired after Dak elected to slide with nine seconds left. Payne, there are so many different ways that we can go about approaching this game. Dallas looked like a dominant force uh, on Monday night against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they deserve credit for putting together a complete effort despite two drives early on that looked anything but electric. But I think the Bucs played a big role in what Dallas was able to do. Revisionist history says that if Tampa scores and goes up 7-6, maybe the dynamic in play looks a little bit different here. But this is also a 49ers team that's getting a ton of credit, and rightfully so, for how electric the offense has looked. But you dig into some of the opponents that Brock Purdy has faced, and this clearly should be a step up in class against the Micah Parsons-led Cowboys defense. Yeah, I mean, this game, again, you're kind of referencing some of those numbers. And at four, we've we've seen some Cowboys money. As soon as that gets down to soft three and a half or even some some rogue threes, we've seen the 49ers get laid. And to me, this game just has a ton of variance. 
And it's partly because the guy you mentioned in Brock Purdy. And I've said this over the last few weeks, metrically, Purdy's playing at a rate that would give Patrick Mahomes a run for MVP if you extrapolate it out for the entire season. But it's a small sample. We've seen Jimmy G have some real success in the system as well. And the defensive quality of opponent, to your point, is absolutely horrific. I would say the one element that Brock Purdy has over Jimmy G is the ability to improvise a little bit. When a play breaks down, he can get outside the pocket and at least find someone or create something that Jimmy G wouldn't, right? As soon as pressure comes on Jimmy G, it's it's hot potatoing the ball. Now, Jimmy G does show a little bit better of an ability to step into the pocket and throw, where sometimes Brock Purdy will, will see a ghost and evade the pocket too soon. But he does have that ability to make some plays outside the pocket. But you look, since Purdy's first start week 14, with a game plan tailored specifically for him by Kyle Shanahan, Purdy's number one in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation among quarterbacks with at least 100 dropbacks. You would think this has a real chance to be a Purdy game. You know, since week 11, you're looking at defenses number one and number two in EPA per rush allowed. Dallas done a really good job stopping the run. So I do wonder if this becomes a little bit of a pass funnel game. There's also some some real familiarity here, right? I mean, Kyle Shanahan was Dan Quinn's offensive coordinator in Atlanta, and that was out of respect. And I know Kyle didn't play against Dan Quinn while Dan was D.C. in Seattle, but the scheme Seattle was implementing remained the same. And there was an interesting podcast that Richard Sherman did this week about how, how Kyle Shanahan basically broke Dan Quinn's defense. And Sherman said that Kyle Shanahan knew the holes of Dan Quinn's Seahawks defense so well that it not only broke the defensive rules so thoroughly, it forced Seattle to change its rules defensively. Now, Sherman was referencing a game where Atlanta played Seattle on the way to that Super Bowl run. Kyle was OC of the Falcons offense with Dan Quinn as the head coach. So was it Kyle or was it Dan Quinn helping Kyle know how to attack a defense he previously built? Who knows? But I thought that was that was pretty interesting. We do have two data points semi-recently where Kyle Shanahan has faced Dan Quinn. And they went against each other in 2019. Dan Quinn actually got the better of Kyle Shanahan. The 49ers finished 20th in EPA per play that week. You have this complex zone run scheme that just couldn't get going. 49ers had a negative 0.21 EPA per rush in that 2019 matchup. It's going to look a little bit differently, right? You could have drove a Mack truck through that explosive run CMC had last week in the first half. I mean, that was just... <laughs> Parting of the Red Sea there for, for CMC. I could have hit that hole, I think, and I'm slow getting out of the blocks. Yes, yes, you are. Um, you, you also have the playoff matchup last season, and I know the 49ers won, but they were held to a negative EPA per play. Now, there is an asterisk there a little bit when you're kind of just gauging offensive success. If you remember, Jimmy G played with that busted thumb on his throwing hand. But the 49ers were held to a negative EPA per play in that matchup. They struggled to run again just to 39% rushing success right now because of Jimmy G's injured thumb Kyle just had this very heavy rush attack and the Cowboys stacked the box on 82 percent of runs in the first half so it's very difficult to get your offense going when a defense knows what you want to do we've talked about Dallas's defense downtrending ahead of last week's game I don't necessarily buy that it's fixed I mean Tom Brady missed throws all night and that game, to your point, is wildly different if Brady doesn't throw his first red zone interception since you know the Reagan administration. Announcer Jinx! And Tampa you takes called the 7-6 lead. Oh, my you God. You called it. I sent you the text. I said they, they showed the graphic. I said, oh, here it comes. Yep. First time since um, 2019, I believe, that he hadn't thrown a red zone pick. You texted me, and about 37 seconds later, I'm still not <laughs> sure who Tom Brady was actually throwing to in that particular spot. Unreal. I was, I was trying to throw it out of the back of the end zone. He just didn't have enough zip on it. You could kind of see from the, uh, like, if you're – you know, used to playing Madden. It's the Madden cam. He was thrown out of the back of the end zone, just didn't have enough zip. But you look, only Skylar Thompson had a worse completion percentage relative to expectation than Tom Brady last week. Brady was 14% below expectation. I mean, guys were wide open all night, and receivers were being held all night, especially in critical spots. You had, you know, the Godwin on third down who was getting held. That was a crucial drive out of the first half. When you do score and go for two, I mean, Godwin's being mugged in the back of the end zone. So the, the refs let Dallas play a little bit, and that was a little bit of a – once I found out the referee assignment there, I very much cooled in that game. You're not a Craig Rolstead fan as it pertains to Dallas Cowboy <laughs> games, it appears. <laughs> 
believe they would go. I went to a perfect nine and zero with him uh, refing. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> um, you know, you look at, bust out the you standard look at Dallas, deviation. Right? Let's figure it out. <laughs> You look at Dallas, I mean, they're they're still 26th in schedule adjusted pass defense since week 14. The only time recently that that gets disguised is when the Cowboys' pressure gets home, right? And, and this is very much what they're built on. The Cowboys are number one in early down pressure rate, roughly 7% better than the second best team. But if the Cowboys don't get pressure, they're extremely vulnerable. And you look at Kyle Shanahan's offense, very much designed to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands quickly uh, you have two good tackles for for the 49ers and this offense is very much built on yak and dallas is bottom 10 in the nfl and yak allowed 49ers again offense is built on yak the last two seasons the 49ers lead the nfl and yak so you know you look at what brock purdy's doing he's very much a point guard facilitating here did have the early struggles against a horrific Seattle Seahawks defense I believe he was nine for 19 in the second half but you actually look at the drive charts five of the first six drives in that first half Purdy was moving him and then you have that element where he was under pressure I know he was moving the ball so he's thinking very successful but you look up at the scoreboard and you're trailing you know you're making your first playoff start there's that element where you you know pissing down your leg or shitting yourself and that just didn't happen I mean they came out in the second half and and really separated and the offense was was very good there so I don't know what to expect to your point right like this is metrically the best defense that Purdy's faced over this this stretch and if Dallas is able to stop the run at the rate they've done the back half of the season it's very much going to be a game in and Purdy's hands and he's going to have to deliver again here Todd now the 49ers offense we obviously have a ton of confidence in Kyle Shanahan he knows the strengths and weaknesses he's going to come up with some unique wrinkles this 49ers offense with more diverse playmakers this year, the way they're currently constructed in the group that we saw go into Dallas. But for the 49ers and all the talk and the praise that gets heaped on D'Amico Ryan's defense, we obviously know Ryan's is interviewing, it feels like, every job out there uh, to potentially to get a head coaching spot. There are some concerns about where the 49ers are deficient, and that's in defending the big pass play. We saw the Seattle Seahawks have success throwing the football to DK Metcalf. If Dak Prescott is on, continuing some of that momentum, the Cowboys have better receivers that can operate in space. When you look at this side of the ball, the Cowboys that I've been clamoring for a little bit saying, hey, get Tony Pollard a few more touches. The first time when him and Ezekiel Elliott were healthy, that Pollard was out there for a greater snap share, as we know Elliott is a shell of his former self. The tight end position, the 49ers have had great success. We know the linebackers are very good. Dalton Schultz ain't going to go bananas like he did last week against against Tampa, but that doesn't mean that the 49ers necessarily have the pieces to slow down the members of the Dallas receiving core, whether it's Michael Gallup, who had a good performance, whether it's CeeDee Lamb, who's their alpha, or T.Y. Hilton, who's provided a nice little compliment operating out of the slot. When you look at the 49ers defensively, Payne, where do they match up well or maybe have some deficiencies against what Dallas wants to do under Kellen Moore's leadership? I mean, this is clearly the other part of the wild variance that we're seeing here among two very respected factions of betters and there is some speculation that Kellen Moore had Todd Bowles hand signals Monday night and that would not be shocking because Tampa has one of the worst coaching staffs in the NFL. Don't worry they fired Byron Leffert so they're good Tampa's fine going forward right? (laughs) That was kind of the reason if you watch Dallas used a ton of no huddle they went tempo on critical drives and in certain situations and high leverage spots and that's that's the speculation and so that's obviously going to help an offense but you look at Dak he was decisive he threw confidently I mean he was just whipping that ball around the area of weakness for the Buccaneers defense was the middle of the field based on Bulls cover two and they were going to have a tough time defending the slot is something we mentioned in that Lamb could have a nice day there and Schultz could have a nice day And that was only magnified when the Buccaneers' top corner, Jamel Dean, announced as a starter before kick, was dealing with an illness and was never on the injury report and never ended up playing a snap. So that was part of the way Dallas was able to attack the Buccaneers' defense a little bit. I I think, you know, again, we're not going to have a scenario where Dak Prescott plays as well as he did on Monday night. I know that's ingrained in everybody's head, but you look for Dak career-wise, Monday was his third best QBR in a game. What Dak Prescott are we getting? The season QBR is 57. He played to a 97 on Monday night, right? At the same time, 
what 49ers defense shows up. If you've been watching closely, D'Amico Ryan's defense has really struggled the last four games, and it's to Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz and Jarrett Stidham and David Blau and Geno Smith. 49ers have allowed quarterbacks to have real success. San Francisco's 27th in schedule-adjusted pass efficiency over the stretch of just horrific quarterbacks that they've faced. And what's interesting is we know Mike McDaniel, right, Dolphins head coach, former 49ers OC, in that matchup, he created a game plan to avoid the middle of the 49ers defense because they have great linebackers. But this was shocking to me when I dug into this game trying to figure out why there was such a battle on this game and you're looking for like answers to some of these questions. The season-long data paints a different picture, oddly. 49ers have actually allowed more than 9.5 yards per target to the slot, sixth most in the NFL. Again, that's where C.D. Lamb lines up on 63% of his snaps. And the 49ers are actually below average 18th in EPA per pass attempt to the slot. The one area where we emphasized and you just rehashed it for us nicely and kind of are leading me in this direction is we thought if Seattle could have success through the air, it was pushing the ball wide and downfield because the 49ers are seventh worst in EPA allowed on throws of 20 plus yards. Dak has been top five in EPA per drop back on throws of 20 plus yards. And, you know, the Cowboys obviously don't have Dak. Their boundary receivers are, are Gallup and occasionally the line T.Y. Hilton up there on a flyer on a go route. Let's see if they're good enough to win consistently on the outside. But that's another area where the 49ers defense has been extremely vulnerable, not just during this, you know, four game stretch, but throughout the course of the season, specifically to the left side of the field, wide left boundary. OK, that's where Lenore typically lines up. Now, if you look at Lenore, he's coming off his best game ever in terms of coverage, but he's been the one 49ers defender that gets picked on by opposing offenses this season. They see Lenore out there, that's who they want to attack. He's below replacement level in terms of coverage, and that's led to the 49ers defense being 26th in EPA per pass attempt allowed to the left boundary, 27th in success rate. Why this is important. Dak loves throwing to the left boundary. It's actually where Dak throws it the most. It's where Dak throws it the best. Dak's quarterback four out of 47 qualifying quarterbacks throwing to the left boundary. 91% accuracy, 60% success rate, plus 0.454 EPA per pass to the left boundary. So there are areas here for the Cowboys to attack. Let's see if Kellen Moore can figure it out on a short week. Just how the last few seasons have played out you'd give the advantage to Miko Ryans, right? But the 49ers defense just doesn't feel like it's in form right now. Last year going into the playoffs, we're like, man, they're in form. Let's see what DAC we get. So just a lot of variance here. And ultimately, again, this is this is the reason we're seeing a battle among the most respected betters on this game where, you know, again, one faction grabs the four. Anytime this goes to soft three and a half or even there's like two spots that, that th- you know, rogue threes popped and they immediately got laid. So very interesting. Same thing with the total. I mean, we texted each other late Sunday night and you said, hey, the opens 45, 45 and a half. I said, that ain't going to last. It's going to go up. Doesn't mean I necessarily love the over because you could see a situation where this game could be in Brock Purdy's hands and he's not as efficient because the Cowboys you know, are, are stopping the run a little bit. You could see a situation where you're not getting the same das- Dak Prescott and you know the, the old 49ers defense returns. Why we're seeing this go up is I think the belief is there's some areas for Dallas to attack through the air and that the 49ers might be a little bit more of a a pass funnel here. But once that total touched 47 at a few spots and the one spot that went to 47 and a half, right, 47 a key number, there was a difference of opinion. That thing got smacked back under and now we're looking at 45 and a half and 46 again here, Todd. So again, not just a battle on the side here, but one on the total as well. Do you remember a weekend with four games of this magnitude where we've seen this much back and forth from some of the most sophisticated and sharpest betting groups out there where there's apparently very little agreement on side or total in any of these games? I've never seen anything like it. And, you know, I texted a couple of my guys and I just said, what are you seeing on here? And they just were like, yep, seeing this. Yep, seeing that over here. <laughs> yep, we're talking to these guys. This is how they're looking, even though it's that the line's, you know, starting to move against their thought. They think they can enter the market a little bit of better price. Like, it is a full-blown battle, side and total, on all of these games to this point. Now, we're recording Thursday morning. Limits are going to increase. I think things will start to shake out a little bit more over the next, you know, two days. 
but there's very much some some positioning going on and a lot of differing viewpoints. You can follow Payne on Twitter. That's at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there as well. Most importantly, as always, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And when you look at the slate, I mean, to your point, I mean, you see all the back and forth. You see some of these teams that are out there from speaking to the sports books, at least early on. And granted, to your point, you mentioned it. Everything's subject to change between now and kickoff. You know, Saturday, going to be all about the two favorites. Moneyline parlays, teaser liability going to the Kansas City Chiefs and Philadelphia Eagles. Books have said they'll need one of those dogs to win outright to put them in a very good spot. Totals up substantially this weekend compared to what we've seen during the course of the regular season where that average total is right around 44.1. We're now up to 49.1 or thereabouts with this quartet of games. Uh, And then for Sunday, we're going to see a very similar betting pattern unfold in both of those games that we've grown accustomed to in the NFL playoffs. The recreational better sees the underdog. They want to bet them on the money line. The recreational better that likes the favorite lays the points. So as it stands for that 49ers Cowboys game, one to three, at least right now, appears to be the best decision for the house uh, if the favorite wins but doesn't cover. We'll see how the early game on Sunday shakes out. Uh, I present all that stuff, Payne, because this is the portion of the show and you know we obviously <laughs> begin to delve a little bit deeper and try and find the most actionable element to get people to the window. So is there anything from a best bet perspective that you see making the cut this weekend? Yeah, I'll be candid here. Like I don't have a large position on any of these games yet. And so, you know, we've kind of adhered to that where we're not just, you know, content guys giving you picks for the sake of picks. We're giving you games that we're strongly invested in. And so I think the best bet at this point is to kind of wait a little bit over the next couple of days. This will obviously get posted on our website, bettheboardpodcast.com. You'll see it atop the homepage and you'll click in there. And at some point, we'll throw a best bet in. Is it five hours from now? Is it? Friday? Is it Saturday morning? Do we pass on the Saturday games and throw something in there early Sunday afternoon? Who knows? We're obviously not going to telegraph that so the website gets hit with traffic and (laughs) shuts it down for the weekend, but there will be a best bet up there at some point. Um, And I think that's that's just kind of how we look. I mean, you know, listen, the last two weeks have have not gone well. I'd make both bets again. Now, obviously, they came on on Buffalo Bills games, but Listen, I liked what we did with the Patriots in week 18. I think we win that game a substantial amount of time. I just, you know, if if you can uh, prognosticate two kickoff returns in the same game, send me an email. I'm happy to uh, make you one of the highest paid employees on the staff. (laughs) Um, Last week, you know, last week, I think we we had a great bet, you know, laying the Bills first half minus seven. Again, Pinnacle closed 10 minus 13 on that game and with you know, eight, nine minutes to go in the second quarter, the live line in the first half spills minus 21 and a half, which you alerted me to. So feel great about that bet as well. Would make it a hundred out of a hundred times again, just, you know, right now don't see a ton, don't want to force it. And uh, ultimately we want to put our listeners in the best spot. And uh, I think waiting does that. So that's kind of how I'm nope, going here. Makes a ton of sense. And look, we understand with seven meaningful football games to go before we get into the dog days of February, March, and some of the rest of the sporting calendar, people want to be in action uh, as often as possible. But the reality of it is what's always differentiated bet the board from some of the other NFL podcasts out there. If we don't have action on a game, we're not going to sit here and give out a pick and force you guys to go to the window with something that we're not investing in uh, with our hard earned cash as well. So sometimes patience is key. Uh, things develop, whether it's a problem whether it's a side, whether information breaks, injury updates, what have you. We will have something for you to try and grow that bankroll as we inch ever so close to the big game in Glendale coming up in a few short weeks. Any final words of wisdom, parting shots, nuggets you'd like to share, updates on the most recent series you're binging or things along those lines? No. I mean, somehow we managed to, uh, we're going to go over an hour and 20 minutes again on just four games. We give everybody enough content that they can ascertain things. If they're leaning one way or another, they can hopefully get a little bit closer. But we, as always, we want you guys to factor in all of the different elements to a handicap, whether it's a side, whether it's a total, whether it's a player prop to make the most informed investments that you can. So regardless of where your wagers take you this weekend, like Payne said, we'll have something available on the website, you know, over the next couple of days to get you ready for the weekend. Uh, But best of luck with all of your wagers, and hopefully we'll see you at 
past the window. Thanks for listening to Bet the Board. You can catch Todd and Payne every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday during football season, breaking down the biggest NFL and college football games. And to make sure you don't miss any free best bets, subscribe to Bet the Board on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.